Okay, I know that was an extremely long side tangent, but we can finally get back to the coding and write value to x. Why did I mention this all? Because it turns out that before we can write the code for value to x, we need to write the code that can find the horizontal scaling of the screen at any given time. Now to do this, I had originally written this array called scales, but I actually don't think I need it, so I'm going to delete it. Because what we're instead going to do is realize, okay, we have the maximum value for each day. Perhaps we want to multiply that by 1.2 or something on the screen so you get a little bit of margin, and then smooth that out with the weighted average linear interpolation to find the true scale at any given day, which could also be a floating point. So let's do that first. The function is going to be get x scale with the input being a day, so float d. And we actually can't write this until we write our interpolation methods. So we'll do that. There's three again. The first one being step index, which is the most straightforward. For all of these, we're going to feed in an array of floats. And we're going to feed in the index, which is also going to be a float because, again, it might not be five or six, it might be 5.7. So a step index, as we've already said, is really, really basic. We just take the index and we floor it. So in this case, we can just convert it into an int, which will do the same thing. And then we use that to call some value of the array and return it. Super basic. I don't think we even need to test that. The next one is linear index. I'll call that lin index. It's similar to lerp, but different. Um, it's going to be like a sister function, so it's going to have the same header. But for this one, we're going to need to separate the index into its integer and non-integer parts. So I will say int index int equals the int part of the index. Okay, that is hard to say in English, but I think you know what's going on. And then the other part is the index remainder, which is going to be the index mod one. Yay, pretty self-explanatory. Now with this, what we can do is we can reference the integer index before, the integer index after, and then interpolate between the two. So the value from before, I'll call this before value, is just the array at the index. And then the after value is the array at the next index. Now this might cause an error if you're at the very end of the array, but what I tend to do with these data visualization videos is just buffer my data set with a few extra days at the bottom so that when it does error, I'm already out of the woods or beyond the current day, so it doesn't matter. So I just ignore it. I know it's bad practice, whatever. So we have the before and after. We also have the kind of progress between the two, which is index rem, so we can use processing this built-in function called lerp, where we have a, b, x, and a is the before value, b is the after value, and then x is index rem. And what this does is essentially, imagine before value is 100, after value is 200, and index rem is like 30%. Then it's gonna tell you what the number is that's 30% the way from 100 to 200, which is 130. So then we can just return that, done. So yeah, those two are the easy ones. As you can see, it didn't take too much brain power. The hard one is the moving average one, but after I've coded it so many times, I feel like it's not that hard either. Okay, moving average. Okay, that's kind of long. I'll just call it MA index. Same header. Now, unlike the others, this one is technically not going to be mathematically perfect because we're going to use kind of a mass sampling method. So I said that for all moving average interpolation, we should use the cosine curve, right? So what does that mean? Well, we have to first figure out how wide we want that window to be. The wider this blue curve is, the slower the transitions are going to seem. And the narrower it is, the more faster and jitterier they're going to look. That is something that's going to depend on what use case we have. So I'm going to also have that be input as a parameter for that function. I'm going to call it, I don't know, window width. If the window width is five, we're going to have five days on either side to sample from, which means we're going to have a for loop from day minus five to day plus five. So I'm going to set those extremes as integer values because we're going to use them as indices. So to start, we take start index. I'll take the index. I'm going to subtract the window width. And then I'm going to int it. Now we should actually seal it. Sorry. 
for reasons I'll explain later, or maybe never. And this could also go before the beginning of time, which would cause problems. So I'm gonna create this max function between zero and that value we calculated. What that's gonna do is it's essentially 99% of the time, this value will just be the one that's used because it's almost always bigger than zero. But say we run into a case where we want to index the moving average at index two and our window is 10, then this is gonna reach all the way back to negative eight, which doesn't exist. So the max is gonna say zero is bigger than negative eight, let's use the zero. So this is a way of capping the minimum values could be to zero, which is what we want. A symmetrical function will be used on the end index, where we take the, okay, first of all, it's the index plus the window width. We're gonna floor it and, okay, floor it, haha. We're gonna take the minimum and the max cap that we can allow is daylen minus one. Remember the minus one because that is the last index of any value array that we're allowed to call. So with this in effect, we can now do our array that's going to sample from every value within this range, including end index. So let's do that. For int d equals start index, d is less than or equal to end index d plus plus. So before we dive into that for loop, we need two more variables. Essentially, whenever you calculate an average, you need to both calculate the sum that you've accumulated so far and a counter for how many numbers you've seen so far so that when you're done, you know what to divide by. But in this case, it's a weighted average, which means that both the summer and the counter are actually floats. At first, it doesn't seem super intuitive, but you get used to it pretty quickly. So they both start out at zero. Also, the word summer is a real word, funny. But as we now dive into the for loop, it gets clearer what we should do. So the value at any integer d is just going to be a indexed at d. But how much weight does that have in our weighted average? I'm gonna change that to wa index. Well, that's where the cosine curve comes in. So we know that if d is exactly window width away from our like observation point, it should have weight zero. If it's exactly window width in the other direction, it should also be zero. But if D happens to be right in the center, right on index, then it should be one. And actually, because it's a weight distribution curve, the factor of like how tall that curve is does not actually matter. So what I'm gonna do is say cosine, we're gonna feed in D minus index. We have to take the absolute, no, we don't. We don't have to take the absolute value because cosine is already symmetrical, but we have to scale it correctly. Basically, if this value comes to window width, we want it to become pi because cosine of pi is the exact negative. So to do that, we're just gonna divide by window width and multiply by pi. But um, these two are both integers. No, because index is a float, I think this should all be floats, so we should be fine. But cosine is gonna return a value between negative one and one, and we want it to return a value between zero and one because weights are always positive. So we just have to multiply it by 0 0.5, which is gonna move it between negative 0.5 and 0.5, and then we add 0.5 to get it between zero and one. So now this whole thing will tell us just the weight, the influence that this value has on the average. From here, it's just the home stretch. The counter is counting how many objects are in the average. But in this case, it's how much weight has been added to the average. The summer is the one that sums up all the values, but we gotta multiply by weight because that's how much weight it has. And that's pretty much all you have to do for counter and summer. And the final result is simply the final value of the summer divided by the final value of the counter. If I've done everything correctly, we can just return that and we're good. So there's the whole function for you to see it if you'd like. But let's do a sanity check. Remember how earlier we were looking at Sally's ranks over time? I can't quite remember whose, but it doesn't matter. Let's go here. Let's print out Sally or whoever's ranks over time again. I'm just gonna choose index eight. It doesn't matter. The ranks D, cool. But to test the weighted average, let's see what the weighted value is. So I'm gonna say float weighted average, weighted average rank equals, we're gonna take this WA index, 
Now I know we're going to run into an error, but I won't get to that yet. We're going to input the array of the person's ranks, then the index, which is D, which happens to be an integer in this case, but it won't always. And then the width of the window. Let's just set it to, I don't know, something big so we can test to see if it's working. 20 should be good. Now this is going to error because WA index is expecting an array of floats, but ranks is an array of ints. Now this doesn't actually change the behavior of the function because integers can be converted into floats. So I guess what I could do is just overload this function and say you can also take in an integer of ints. And like this would actually compile, but I've duplicated code. So I don't know what I would do here. Maybe I would say create a new array called a float and make it the same length as a length and then go through the whole thing for int i equals zero i is less than a dot length i plus plus a float i equals a i and then simply call wa index with a float instead maybe that's the best way to do it that should also work too but i think that's more that's more acceptable i suppose so let's comment these two out because we're not using them and with that, we should have both person 8's rank and WA rank at any given moment. And the reason I want to do this is because I want to demonstrate what this code is accomplishing. So I'm going to run it. We're going to get all these values. I'm going to copy it. We're going to go back to the fake database spreadsheet, open up a new tab, paste the data in, split it apart per column. Um, I'm going to move it down one row. And then I'm going to say this is true rank. This is weighted average rank. I'm going to graph it and look what you get. That's not right. I'm going to add just dates here so it knows that this is dates over time. Okay, now it should be easy for Google Sheets to give us a chart and pay attention to what you see. The blue line shows you the true rank of this person at any given day. Now who is this person? It's index 8, so let's actually find out who. This is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. It's Jimmy. So Jimmy is the yellow line here. So it's this guy, this guy. You can see that his, he fluctuates a lot in, during the middle of the time period and then falls really far down. So this graph makes sense. He's going between first and second quite a lot and then he starts to fall down and end up in like ninth or 10th place. But the red line is the weighted average and you can see it's much smoother than the blue line but kind of gets the general shape across anyway. And another thing I wanna point out is that for a very short split second near the end, Jimmy falls to 10th place for maybe a day. The red line barely moves because of that, but that's actually the desired behavior because it, it happens so quickly that were the bars actually move down and move back up at the same time, it would look very jerky and hard to follow. So everything is working as intended. So this is a good validation that the code for our weighted averaging works. With that being said, we can now finally write the code that will get us our horizontal scaling. And the reason why this is finally true is because to get the x scale, we're simply going to take the maximum value, use the weighted average to smooth it out a bit, and multiply it by 1.2 so that we get the margin. So it's actually only one line of code. wa index feed in maxes as our array, d as the index, and what's the window width? Well, for the horizontal scaling, I really don't want the scaling to jitter around a lot. So a higher window in this case is better. So I would say something like 14, like two weeks. I think that's appropriate. And then we just return that. Don't forget to multiply by a 1.2. And since this is something that a lot of people are going to use in the same frame, it's something that I guess we could calculate once per frame and then save it. So I know it's not good to have global variables and my a CS teacher from high school will yell at me, but I'm just going to say float x scale equals negative one or something. And then at the beginning of each iterative draw call, I'll say x scale equals get x scale current day. Now current day doesn't exist yet, but I'll solve that later. Now let me write value to x. That's where you take in a value of an IQ or something, maybe it's like 150, and it spits out what the X coordinate on the screen of where that should appear is. So the input is going to be the IQ, which I'll call value, because I want this code to be applicable to other types of data, not just IQ. Now we're gonna get the X scale, but since that's saved into the variable called X scale, I'll put it here. 
So what should the x coordinate be? Well, let's think about fractions. Basically, if we take a value and divide it by x scale, which is essentially like the maximum value on the screen, if that's like 10%, that means that the x coordinate should be 10% away from the left point of the edge to the right edge, right? So I'm gonna take x min and then add this proportion of x width to it to get the x coordinate that it should be at. And I think that should work. Also a very short function. So with that all done, the two most fundamental equations of this whole program are done. How to get the x coordinate and how to get the y coordinate. Now we have to deal with this current day variable that doesn't exist. I want you to realize that when we're rendering this bar graph video, it's going to be an image sequence. And that means we're gonna be rendering thousands of images, one per frame of the video. So I'm gonna to have to loop through current day, incrementing it slowly so we get a smooth transition. So I'm going to create an integer variable called frame count. Now actually that already exists in processing and counts how many frames. However, I wanna use my own because that gives me the ability to jump ahead to like 10,000 frames if I want to just render the middle of the video or something. And frames at the very end of draw, the iterative function is going to be incremented. Nothing will ever come after this. That's very important. So now at the beginning of the function, current day, I'll make that a global as well, which is bad, is gonna be some function of frames, probably based on another variable called speed. Actually, to describe it more accurately, I should say something like frames per day, because that helps you figure out what that means. Now here's where you have to do some math, because you're figuring the data set is 700 something days, Maybe I want my video to be two minutes, maybe three. That's about 150 seconds. So 700 days, 150 seconds, we're talking about five days a second. So I render all my videos at 60 frames per second. If there's 60 frames in a second and there's five days per second, there's going to be 12 frames per day. So I'm gonna put a 12 here. And maybe just to test things out, I'll make it like 11.97, just to make sure that the floating aspect of it is working. So I'm gonna scroll down, current day equals frames divided by frames per day. Now, if I ever need to render the middle of the video, I can just add a plus some big number here, and that'll help shift me to a later place in time. It's time traveling. So now we have current day. We also have X scale, which looking at this, I think I should rename it to current scale, just to make it consistent with current day. So I'm gonna do that done. I believe we can finally move on to drawing the rectangles on the screen. 